Europe needs to, in my view, uh, first of all, like the Americans used to say in the Trump administration times, you know, America first. I think that Europe needs to do a little bit of the same thinking uh, if we want to see uh, Europe, uh, um, let's say, retaining its very important, its very important uh, position in in uh, the global domain. Uh, after the crisis, it was very obvious that, for instance, United States was capable in producing monetary policy, which was for the United States very good, quantitative easing. That's what I'm talking uh, about. And they have aggressively got into that. For the Europeans to get on the same track, it took years. And those years were years of, let's say, very low levels of growth actually increasing the the gap that Miroslav has pointed to rightfully uh, between the US and and Europe and and Europe simply in my view um, has to be let's say more brave Hello everybody this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and today I'm hosting a panel of experts to discuss the future of the European monetary and economic system. I'm delighted to have with me three former central bankers who agreed to share their professional insights. First, we have with us Professor Dejan Šoškić, who was the head of the National Bank of Serbia from 2010 until 2012. Next, we are also joined by Miroslav Singer, who served as governor of the Czech National Bank from 2010 until 2016. And last but not least, we've got Ardian Fulani with us, who was the governor of the Bank of Albania for 10 years from 2004 until 2014. Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming online today. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. I am... I am very excited to host such a such a high level panel with three people who had to look at the economy for on, on a daily basis in order to set monetary policy. And of course, and these habits they don't go away uh, quickly. So you've all been also studying the economy as it is going. And I would very much want to know from you what you are thinking, what the greatest challenges are to the economies of the, of the European continent. And maybe we start with uh, Dejan first, and then we go to Miroslav and uh, and then uh, Ardian. Well, um, <clears throat> to a certain extent related to the discussion that we had previously on your channel, Pascal, I do think that, that the main challenge actually for the European economy is um, to uh, try to, let's say, um, uh, keep its competitiveness in the global markets, which is uh, quite challenging in the times uh, that we are facing, especially um, having in mind not just the, uh, you know, the very competitive Chinese economy, which is um, becoming dominant in many areas of of uh, industrial production, but also, as we see recently, in high tech, but um, mainly concerning the fact that Europe actually needs to import certain things, especially maybe uh, adequately um, um, uh, priced uh, energy to support this competitiveness in the global domain. Uh, in the other uh, aspect, I would say that uh, Europe has defined quite well what they would like to achieve in the forthcoming period, in a sense that they would like to see uh, uh, quality education being uh, one of the primary goals and um, innovation in high-tech industries. And I believe that that is a, a very important uh, uh, Thing, obviously. But in addition to that, um, one might argue that perhaps some sort of, a, a, let's say, realignment of the decision making uh, uh, structures within the EU might be also appropriate to make this union uh, maybe uh, more efficient in terms of decision making, since I would say that uh, the main competitors of the EU today, meaning US and China, are actually unified states and might do some decision making uh, uh, more uh, efficiently and more speedy, uh, capable of reacting maybe more promptly to the challenges of the global market. And I would say that this uh, reform in the EU might also be, be an important thing for, for, for the growth of Europe. Um, Miroslav, do you see it the same way? The, I mean, what, what, what is the biggest problem that the European economies are are going to face over the next couple of years? I believe, uh, honestly, I, I believe those are. Uh, I, I agree with uh, the list uh, they are provided, but uh, at the same time, I think they are more as signals of uh, 
of underlying problem than uh, than the problem itself. I I believe if we take a look on uh, what has happened in last quarter of century in which uh, uh, Europe as opposed to US lost its uh, something like one third of its position in the global economy. I mean, like it's decreased from one quarter of uh, of uh, world economy to, to something like 16-17 percent, yeah, which is quite a slight actually. And the US at the same time kept its position at about a quarter yeah, of, uh, of uh, the world economy. So, so we have a counter example out of developed uh, rich world that, uh, that the position could be sustained. Yeah. And if we, if, we, if we took a look on what differs in Europe over those years, it's definitely the size of state on the economy. And I believe the, the European problem is uh, is deeper than, uh, than that uh, it needs to improve the working of EU. I, I believe the, the problem is that simply it has uh, excessively bloated state at the expense of, uh, of private sector. And that's uh, no matter whether this is due to EU workings or it's partially, of course, due to state workings because EU EU budget is not sizable, uh, sizable uh, in in relative terms. Yeah, but uh, but that's a problem, and I I don't see any any simple solution because I don't honestly I don't believe the the voters are recognizing that and are ready to uh, to recognize that and we are living in democracies. I'm very happy about that. Actually, I lived first more than 20 years of my life in a non-democratic society and, and those were worse times for sure. But at the same time, democracy simply has a problem of, uh, of solving this, uh, this situation. Ardian, do, do you also think that, that the problem is structural in nature um, or like where are the, the problems of the of the European economies coming from? I fully agree with my colleagues, and uh, I believe that it's uh, the the European uh, uh, question now is more complex. Whenever I discuss for Europe, I go back and see how the founding fathers, you know, have been uh, projected that. And Monet, for example, said that the Europe. Uh, will uh, will be forged in crisis, which I fully agree on that. But but times changing, and I don't want that, uh, as was mentioned before, that the European will be transformed in the structure of how to overcome crisis in continuation. So Europe needs to be, uh, I think with a general plan how to be reconstructed, because the problems are, are global. For example, the main issues which I, uh, which I can emphasize are productivity and, uh, and innovation. You face a persistent productivity gap, particularly in, in uh, advanced technologies and uh, digitalization. The region struggle through innovation, uh, translating it into commercialization and global competitiveness, which is a lack of that. Another thing I think is the fiscal sustainability. High public debt accumulated in the years, being in the context of the crisis and the general debt worldwide. So we have a lot of money. Huh? We are, there are a lot of money in the market. And as the old saying in Albania is that too much money spoils the market. And I think here it's a, uh, it's a big challenge of, uh, of Europe, the fiscal system, sustainability, in compliance with stability and growth pact, as we have it now. And sustainable debt management is very necessary. So. This is my opinion. It's a, it's a very you know uh, uh, important structural issue that uh, that that have to uh, Europe has to has to to, to see it very carefully. Uh, strategic investments are here very important, mostly in the green energy and the infrastructure and uh, 
management uh, management uh, to 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 be much more uh, uh, innovative but do and you uh, thank Main, you very much yeah um, another one which is very important here i think also and we have to mention now it's the geopolitical risk and energy dependence like the others uh, were emphasizing but uh, the political uh, the policy makers should agree about the the strategy of uh, critical uh, auto, auto, autonomous sectors the um th thank you for that and geopolitical risk is a, is a very good um it's a very good uh, uh, keyword because the war between Russia and Ukraine has really changed a lot on the of the the, the way the economies in Europe work just because of the abrupt and, and and quite severe decoupling from Russia and we are seeing now two and a half years later the uh some of the effects i mean the the german economy is heavily suffering and uh, volkswagen is closing its uh, uh a lot of its uh, factories and the the this engine what used to be an engine of the eu at least but of the of the european markets more uh, more largely seems to be stuttering and 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 like uh, maybe maybe starting to fail do you three think that the the general lack in productivity that that you already talked about that this can be that this this can be remedied by the european economies themselves or do they need to find more partners especially also for econo uh, um, energy security because at the moment the lng that's coming from the from the us is much more expensive than what uh, used to be imported through uh from russia um well, where do you see ways out of this economic downturn that we're seeming to see maybe we start again with uh, dayan yes thank you well <clears throat> Uh, you know, I would uh, also connect uh, the welfare state that has been developed mainly in, in Western Europe uh, to a certain extent with this lack of productivity, you know. Uh, uh, the United States hasn't uh, reached the, those heights of uh, welfare state as Europe has, um, China especially, and that, in my view, reflects uh, uh, maybe to a certain extent uh, Europeans have a more life-work balance in their lives but on the other hand, it really also reflects on the hours they put uh, and the productivity they have. Therefore, if he, if one would want to uh, overcome this issue and preserve, let's say, the, the good habits that the Europeans have, I would say that then there is an, an additional uh, reason why to invest in high technology. And we haven't seen those, you know. We see that United States is a global, um, uh, uh, let's say, leading economy in terms of high-tech industries, to a certain extent China, but Europeans' high-tech companies simply lag behind. And I would say that that also has something to do with the decreasing competitiveness that we see nowadays is hitting Germany, uh, Germany uh, car manufacturing. Uh, cars uh, nowadays developed by some of the leading manufacturers, especially in, in the domain of electric cars, are basically unified software solutions. Uh, they are um, uh, products that are um, built around hardware and software, not necessarily in the way that traditional car makers have been building their cars. So this is something that gives a competitive advantage to, uh, let's say, Tesla, but also to Chinese producers. We see now that the shifting is not going to be easy in Europe. And when we see that uh, Germany is uh, having, um, let's say, hard time to uh, uh, increase their production in, in the industries in which they traditionally were very uh, competitive and maybe global leaders, that's not a good sign for Europe as well. We all suffer if Germany's economy is not doing well. We are very much related even in, in Southeast Europe. I do know that our trade is basically dominant, uh, dominantly tied to what is happening to Germany, Austria and Northern Italy. And if these regions go down in terms of economic activity, then the Southeast Europe also also suffers. But getting back to, to this geopolitical question, um, in my view, uh, the trend that we are experiencing nowadays concerning the European politics is unfortunately such that uh, if Europe wants to be seen as an ally of the United States, 
it is translated into basically lack of independent policies. And I do not think that that is good. Uh, Europe has been traditionally a good ally of the United States. But in decades before, we had a, let's say, long list of European leaders which were at the same time uh, uh, allies to the US, but also capable of articulating independent policies which are more pro-Europe and in line with European interests. And I believe that maybe uh, all of the three of us have been on inauguration of Mario Draghi in 2012, uh, when we had the privilege of listening to Valéry Giscard d'Estaing and Helmut Schmidt before um, you know, French president and German chancellor, which, are current, which were at that time currently in office, took over. And I would say that it was obvious to whoever was listening, and I would like to check my my impressions with with uh, Ardian and Miroslav. Uh, it was a, a you know a great difference. The the two older gentlemen were European visionaries in my view, and that is something that I uh, do not see enough in in the current uh, European policies. Sometimes it asks for certain brave moves. It does not necessarily mean that by uh, doing good for Europe, you are abandoning your traditional allies. And I would say that there is uh, room for some win-win solutions, especially in, let's say, some processes which would hopefully um, come in front of us in a sort of some sort of detente where, uh, you know, people will try to get uh, closer to some modus vivendi that would be satisfactory for, for various sides. Europe needs to, in my view, uh, first of all, like the Americans used to say in the Trump administration times, you know, America first, I think that Europe needs to do a little bit of the same thinking uh, if we want to see uh, Europe, uh, um, let's say, retaining its very important it's very important uh, position in, in uh, the global domain. Uh, after the crisis, it was very obvious that, for instance, United States was capable in producing monetary policy, which was for the United States very good, quantitative easing. That's what I'm talking uh, about. And they have aggressively got into that. For the Europeans to get on the same track, it took years. And those years were years of, let's say, very low levels of growth actually increasing the, the gap that Miroslav has pointed to rightfully uh, between the US and, and Europe. And, and Europe simply, in my view, um, has to be, let's say, more brave, not to break the, its alliance with the United States not to, by far, but to be also more conscious of their own priorities in, in uh, decision making. Miroslav, Ardian, do you agree? Maybe Miroslav first. Well, uh, not with everything, honestly, uh, Joe said. First, uh, Pascal, uh, uh, slowdown of German economy is not here uh, from the increase of price of energy. The German industry starts falling from 2018, which is the time in which uh, energy was uh, perfectly cheap. Actually, the price of energy was decreasing still, uh, I believe, till uh, 2020. So and and from that time we see the the decline of uh, of German industry and German industrial might in in this respect. Uh, second, what I would just correct, uh, I think it's always more precise than to talk about war between Russia and uh, Ukraine to talk about Russia aggression in Ukraine because this is what it is, uh, and. Uh, and this is what causes the, the dramatic shift. Yeah, the previous Russian aggression were not, uh, in a sense, successful in quotation mark in that. But uh, more importantly, I am not sure whether uh, uh, Europe, whether the deficiencies of Europe is the lack of uh, vision and uh, are due to the lack of vision and leadership. I think that I'm more afraid that first to Europe as a political entity is not the uh, is not a state. There are different countries with very different uh, approaches towards uh, towards uh, Russia, for example. I mean, I think uh, German versus uh, Poland or Czech Republic vis-a-vis -vis, uh, before the Russian aggression in Ukraine. I mean, like this, there was a leadership, there was a vision in Germany, there was a vision in Germany transferred to Europe, and this was a wrong vision. This was a vision of Russia as a, as a supplier of cheap energy, tied together with uh, Nord Stream pipelines. And now we know it was complete, uh, completely wrong. And, uh, and there was ignorance. I mean, I say the, the building of this uh, pipeline started in 2014. We 
which was the year of, uh, of first Russian, uh, effectively aggression in the Ukraine yeah? and the annexation of Crimea, just to put it poly- geopolitically in a context there. Yeah? So I am uh, I'm not sure if that is working, and uh, and I I think uh, Europe should come to grips uh, with the recognition that it's not a global superpower in a league with uh, U.S. or China. It's not a pattern that the world will follow, because the world is seeing Europe not as a not as a likable, desirable pattern. The world world sees Europe, I believe, as a as a nice place to have a rest. Great, great continent to spend a year or two, but not a place to to get rich, not a place to build a the firm, not a place to 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 bring a success to your life. And we should come to grips with that. And now I'm completely with them, actually on on a solution. I believe we should start understanding that we must orient ourselves in this in this world uh, with uh, partners. And I. I'm not exactly happy about that, but there is the only one alternative partner from the uh, US, which is China, like it or not. And also I would put it in a context of US elections. If, uh, if they turn out, uh, as it appears, uh, that uh, Donald Trump is going to be president, at least this is how I read the, the current, uh, current election pool data, we will have a guy who is hypersensitive about his uh, skills uh, in negotiating. The guy who is pro- who is not going to give us uh, anything for the fact that we limit our partnership only to US. And at the same time, the guy who would be probably quite sensitive in a good sense to the fact that uh, we start signaling that the uh, US is not our own, our only partner. And vis-a-vis the, the risk of, uh, of doing a little bit more with China, uh, China is simply geopolitically on a on the opposite uh, cont- on the opposite part of the world. The risks are definitely not imminent for Europe. I understand that this is a re- rival of US in uh, in Pacific area, but we are not living in Pacific area. That's, uh, so so that would be. But for that, I, I'm not sure if we are able to do this whenever. I, I think a lot, lot of bigger countries are effectively thinking about that. But uh, but I'm not sure whether uh, whether we can afford it, given our uh, defense dependence on the U.S. and given uh, how we see ourselves as a still, I would say, the self-image of EU elites is we are leaders of the world apart with U.S. and China, and that's a failure, and I think that's a misconception. Ardian, do you agree? Do we need yeah. more yeah. Europe? Yes, I I, um, um, I I agree. Uh, in general, with my with my friends and colleagues, and uh, as I emphasized since the beginning, it's a very complex, uh, com- uh, complex issue now Europe, and in the in the geopolitics of the day. But we have to, uh, as I said in the beginning. Uh, and I will take it from uh, my my friend uh, Miroslav. So Monet was saying, and it is true even for today, that the countries of Europe are too small to guarantee their people uh, necessary prosperity and social development. And so for that we need we need partners. But if you see the uh, how the uh, globalization has worked in all these years, I think that we are facing the problems coming from the globalization like inequality, like protectionism, like uh, populism, which I think have been facing a lot in the uh, European perspective. And another thing is that uh, of course, we are going through the crisis, but if you see the last 20 years from 2007, we are under we are under crisis uh, uh, as, as, as Europe, you know. First of all, with the financial crisis, 2007, and the continuing, even today, the reminiscence of that. And then we have the COVID, and then we have the wars. So we have to understand that we are under a war situation 
And as my colleagues emphasize, so we have to take care about that. And the choice of Europe, the choice of Europe, of being in the middle of China and America was not the right thing. And as you say in Albania, if you eat from both sides, we would likely bite your tongue. Uh, you know, and uh, these balances cannot be sustainable <laughs> indefinitely. You know, Europe must evolve into a respected competitor and partner, should be a partner, not in the middle of the these big giants, uh, giants which are very important partners, but in the meantime, they should see us as a partner, yeah? not uh, uh, not as a stronger lion or as a goodwill for to cooperate and work work with us. And uh, as Miroslav was saying, if we ask something, for example, if you want to, let's go down to the business. If you're going to ask now and buy uh, solar panels in Germany, they immediately will direct you to a Chinese company. You know, and the Germany is the engine of, uh, <laughs> as we know, but Germany is facing all problems, not problems of today, you know. And today's problems in German, urgent, is the working force, and which is taken from everywhere, but this working force is not sustainable. We see, for example, I give you a case in Albania. People from Albania, good workers, they go to, to, to Germany. And I asked them after when they came and say, why did you come? Why did you stay there? Ah, for a lot of reasons, it's better to go and come. But they say, I will go, I will go again. I say, why do you go again? Because I have been trained. I get a lot more experience working there. So they need the working force, but the working force is not sustainable now. So we have to think for that, how to integrate our countries in South and Eastern in the map of Europe but not with the eyes we have seen before. We cannot change, we cannot change the view, you know, the, the landscape of Europe. But we have to change our eyes, how to see Europe in the context of opening. Europe is all about trust. We have to open, be transparent, <clears throat> and inclusion, money inclusion. We have to, to, to get these new forces surrounding Europe and putting them together now in, in this big plan you know, in this productivity plan. But we have to put them now, not like later. We can we cannot see the Eastern Europe like a mezzanine. You put in the mezzanine, and when you are qualified, maybe in 20, 30, 40 years, you go there. No. We are able to go now because we are sending, we are sending, uh, uh, you know, working force to you. But this is not sustainable. We should work under the programs together, how to build together Europe. And I think Europe has to be a real partner, need also to consider this working force from us, you know, and working with the programs, how this working force to be sustainable in the Europe. Yeah. So the problem is also another one, which is linked with this, with the future of Europe, it's also how do we see now the Washington consensus? When America is thinking how to reevaluate it, and where are we in this Washington consensus? The other thing is, uh, however, uh, so the transformation and dominance in nation interests toward the EU. So how is this interest, and how is translated that in Brussels? How are these? Uh, relationship with the nations and this is in general in general if you see the legislation you know we need more legislation we need uh, the legislation in accordance with the eu perspective we have to harmonize that and more if you want to go digital we have to begin yesterday for the legislation because there is no legislation about the, the high tech, about CBDC, about digital finance, about uh, financial money inclusion. You know, there is not. There, there is a cacophony. It does not mean. That. And in this respect, I think we have to bring a trialogue, you know, between nations, the EU, and the businesses. If that does not happen, then we will be in the middle of big partners, which 
they will work with us if we will be competitors, will be the real partners. If not, we will see our consequences as collateral damages, not as a part. This is my idea. Look at Italy, for example. Italy, four or five years ago, they introduced this famous plan, famous plan, 110%, you know, how to boost productivity uh, uh, in, 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 in Italy. And now what happened? It was only pouring money without any result. And you don't know where the money went now and how the people has been reimbursed and pushing the productivity growth. So these things are, I think, are crucial on the future of, of Europe. Uh, but as Steve Jobs was saying, and for that I'm optimist, let's go and invent now. Let's go and invent now rather than worrying about yesterday. But we do have in Europe a couple of challenges, which is first, not all countries in Europe are part of the EU. Secondly, even inside the EU, we have imbalances. Uh, yeah. We have a single currency for some, but not for others. Um, new states who would want to join, if Serbia or Albania wanted to join, I think they would in theory be required to to adapt uh, adopt the, the, the euro. But I think this this is a very... This is a this is a difficult discussion today. Um, we also don't have a transfer mechanism between the different EU states. Is this something that would that would be needed in order to get more unified European development or not? Maybe again, Dejan first, and then Miroslav. And just maybe a slight slight uh, addition. I mean, um, not every uh, European nation is is part of the eurozone, and that is not a requirement. So, the, if the country wants to join the eurozone, there is basically a set of rules, including the uh, getting into the so-called ERM two for let's say uh, several years and uh, macroeconomic convergence uh, that needs to happen um, while the exchange rates are fixed and so on. So, um, I would say that that's also one of these uh, semi finished uh, projects within the uh, um, Europe, which in my view are also connected to the way the decisions are being made. Uh, a very noble uh, initial intention that uh, every nation has to actually um, uh, be agreed uh, in order to implement something, you know, that may uh, be relatively uh, efficient in the times of the 70s and 80s and maybe early 90s but now as you see the, the number of nations is is much uh, larger and uh, the diversity among these countries is is much higher so i think that for the Euro for europe to have a, a really an additional um, uh, let's say um, uh, chance for for success it needs to do the restructuring of the decision making process and uh, obviously, the countries that want to join uh, need to uh, follow certain rules. But, you know, uh, concerning the Southeast Europe that you have mentioned, where Albania and Serbia are situated in some other countries, you know, we are basically surrounded by Europe. So uh, one could also argue that it's not an enlargement. It's basically digestion of something which is within, you know, territorially. But unfortunately, as we see it from the Southeast Europe, and I, uh, I would also like to see, to hear Ardian's um, view on this, uh, we see this process as basically keeping us in line to wait for the membership. However, by keeping us in line, it seems uh, that we are drifting away, you know, in terms of institutional development and other parameters that if you look at the uh, international observers that are following these things, some of these countries in Southeast Europe are actually maybe further away from European values and standards than they were maybe 10 years back or, or, or something. So um, just keeping the countries out uh, is, in my view, no guarantee that they will converge. So if uh, there is a, so, sort of a plan to unify the continent, then I would say that more needs to be done. Uh, unfortunately, that all also asks for additional effort on the side of the EU, but also on the side of the countries that are interested in joining. But it, it seems uh, that the attractiveness, the, the pooling power of, of uh, European Union is a little bit and slightly fading. And I would say that it would be very important to uh, reestablish uh, let's say the the European idea maybe on on uh, different grounds 
maybe to go more into the direction that was heavily um, opposed by some member states, and that is more in terms of creating something that would resemble a, a federal state. You know, without that, uh, the, the whole uh, idea of European monetary system and the single currency is basically on very fragile ground, I would say. You know, whenever... I mean, um, Euro is going to be there, obviously, uh, if there is a political will. That is, I would say, the, the, the force number one. But it's very important that you have solid economic grounds for the, sol for the unified currency. All of these nations which have adopted Euro basically have um, adopted the currency which they cannot produce. So that has initially basically increased their credit risk in, in the eyes of uh, uh, foreign investors. You know, I would, I would argue that maybe uh, the discrepancy in interest rates uh, between um, uh, Greek sovereign debt and German sovereign debt in, uh, let's say, 2010 wouldn't be as high if this Greek sovereign debt was in the national uh, currency which they can produce. So these challenges do exist, and the fact that the exchange rate is basically fixed within the Eurozone, not allowing depreciation and, and um, you know, um, appreciation of national currencies in order to uh, be a, a factor that can um, help the establishment of the, the trade balance between uh, certain countries and, and, and zones within the European Union. I think these are all challenges which need to be need to be seriously addressed. And I do not see the way uh, to really long term preserve the system if there is not going to be a more pronounced step towards uh, some sort of a federal federal state uh, miroslav do you see it like that too what's and what what are your thoughts on the euro as a, as a project of of helping the integration of the eu well uh, uh i would i would start with uh getting uh to productivity then i would address euro and uh if you if you, if you don't mind the productivity uh gap is caused effectively by three things. Yeah. Uh, lower amount of hours worked, uh, less labor force. Actually, we, we in Europe uh, succeeded in getting ourselves in a situation in which we, we face at the same time the problem of migration in flux and lack of labor force. Yeah. This, is, this is sort of unique. If you, if you think about that. Yeah? U.S. at the same time got something like 40 million new people working in the U.S. in the last uh, quarter of uh, of, uh, of century. Yeah? We, 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 we are losing people. There is less European than there were. Yeah? And, and at the same time, we have a migration problem. That, that's amazing. Yeah? That's, uh, that's completely contradictory from the, from the first view. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, total factor factor productivity, which is effectively the uh, the buzzword for innovation and and uh, and other things like that. Yeah. And in terms of hours worked, uh, I I have already spoken about the number of people. In terms of hours work, if you see the Draghi report, it has a few sacred cows. One of them is European social state, but. But that's a that's a source of problem. Yeah. Our social state is overly social. Yeah. So sorry for saying that, but this is this is in a nutshell why we work less. This is in a nutshell why people come to Europe not to not to build that is their work their own life, but draw benefits and bring the families to draw benefits and so on and so on. This is a problem, and unless we start talking about that, we we, we have no chance to. To do it, and I'm very skeptical. I, I again, I, I completely believe in democracy. European voters uh, spoke this year, and it effectively chosen the same. The it formed the parliament that uh, actually reconfirmed the trends from past. Yeah? Same coalition, same same president. The lady which was previously uh, responsible for the Bundeswehr uh, decline in power. Yeah? Sorry for, for saying that. But, uh, so what are we what are we talking about to change? And now, again, I mean, we, we, we like to look in past and see the things brighter. But what are the last two projects of Europe? Two big projects. So each politician has 24 slash 7 slash 365 
the three, six, five year uh, time, like everybody else. Yeah? So, so the time for of European politicians allow for a few projects, for few for just a few big projects. That's Europe, and that's Schengen. Yeah? Those are the largest two European projects. Schengen will keep quite narrow now. Euro, what was Euro supposed to bring? It was supposed to bring trade benefits. I, I can quote a number of econometric studies showing that these benefits are marginal. Why? Because the technology erased actually the advantage of uh, price transparency in times of facts and uh, spreadsheet, price, trans uh, price transparency, price, I would say, finding was costly exercise. Now it is. I mean, it costs next to nothing to raise your phone, find the price in a different currency, and and transfer it to your currency if you if you care about it. Yeah. Simply, it, it erased the advantage of euro. Then, second thing that euro was supposed to bring is a federalization of Europe. I mean, I, it was not done openly, but I believe that was a plan. Yeah. I, I I think we all agree that that this was supposed to happen. Yeah. The, the, the famous Cortes burning the ships. Yeah? And, but the euro is here 25 years. I mean, the, in, in a dematerialized form, 20 years in as a, as a bank notes. Do you see any federalization? Do you at least see some something like euro being a pillar of European values? We, we have some cases of, uh, of countries in Europe that are obviously diverging uh, politically. Slovakia, our great neighbor, previously of course Cyprus was, but it was uh, happily so small not to be not to be that visible. But Euro is not a pillar of uh, of integration, even on on political area. That's completely clear now with uh, this lower case. So in this respect, this uh, this was a big project that brought relatively marginal benefits and we are all of course praying that the project is not going to fall on our heads for uh, the reasons that are obvious but but it doesn't mean that it's it's, it's greatly beneficial and and then uh, there are people who are responsible for these projects and if you if you don't talk uh, federalization you are effectively saying that the people who made the wrong decisions in the past should have more power i don't think we, we can go like that May may I uh, give give the word to Ardian? Do you see a future in the in the project of the euro and of like further European integration? Sure. If we don't see the future, uh, we will not be able to discuss today and uh, see how our country is to be integrated. So we believed and we still believe in the project. But I fully agree with the problems raised by by my colleagues. They are very outdated, and uh, they are not looking at the past. Of course, they analyze it, but they look to the future. Because to be optimist, uh, you should live with the future, not with the past. And uh, I think uh, there is a big question mark. Will Draghi continue to be a salvator of Europe? Because, okay, once it is in 2012 and they say whatever it takes. But if you see that it has two parts, it's whatever it takes, but the most important thing which people neglected is the second part. He said, we have a lot. So we have a lot. That means there is a lot of ammunition there. Do you, is this now is this now coherent? It's not. And that because we have the second time Draghi as a salvator, you know, which come with a new program. But what he's saying is Europe suffer from the lack of, I think, I understood it, creative destruction. Means that Europe is just about to fall if you don't take the measures now. And the measures are tough. And the measures are to be sold again by money. You know, will the, will the people be, be <laughs> agreed, all of them, this fraction euro that we have to put again 800 billion is the only solution. I do agree with that. 
The problem is how will function that and how the people, how the people will be together to push the productivity growth, which is not just a saying, it's very important. There is a lot of, of windows there, you know, and doors open and not open to the to the uh, to the box of the productivity growth. So this is the, the problem. And I said, let's translate the Draghi report to whom, for whom the bell tolls. Let's go to Hemingway, but not to dis, uh, de, uh, destroy bridges, but to bring bridges. These bells is for all of us. Is the last time that these bells are tolling, I think. And this is the main problem. Because we don't have only simple problems of, uh, uh, of uh, as we mentioned here, you know, of fractioned uh, and not fractioned euro. Euro is fractioned. And it was seen during the COVID. Some of the states has been much more important and cooperative. Uh, some of the states, uh, some of the cities be more important than their own states, you know. When the COVID came and there have been a lot of problems, how to send medicine one, one from one country to another one, there have been countries, even from us, which we send uh, people to your, uh, to Italy to, 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 to help and doctors and that. But when the problem came, it was the Milan, the city of Milan, which sent, uh, which sent trucks with medicines to the city of Naples. So we still have in Europe this big fraction, you know, fraction in Europe, which we have to take care. Of. Not going as Miroslav uh, and uh, Dayan discussing before about the other problems which have in Europe concerning the big debt. The big debt there is a very big debt in front of us, and a part of it is a. There are the, the balance sheets of the ECB. The balance sheets of the ECB are like a harmonica, you know. Will that harmonica try to close and play another music or will stay like this? How will, what will happen with the debt accumulated there? It's a good question. <laughs> and uh, um, I think, Miroslav, you, wanna, you want to uh, add something? I would like I would like to just to 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 clarify my my point on Europe. I would like also to just to mention uh, Ardian. You you mentioned uh, the lack of uh, of uh, cyber say uh, framework or legislation. But actually, we have a we have a GDPR and we have an AI law. Those are European initiatives, yeah? and these European initiatives force. Each car repairer to has its own GDPR compliant procedures. Are, you, are we really afraid of somebody learning that uh, we, we repair the car or change the tires? Is it, is, is, it, is it why we need it? No, of course not. And AI law. And AI law just, which is European. Yeah, this is a part of future, say, federal Europe. AI law so far is resulting now in Apple not bringing its newest tools in Europe because it's not worth the risk. Uh, or for Apple, this is not a small, insignificant startup. Uh, but this, uh, the outcome is we will <coughs> not have the tools for our uh, software developers. We will not have the experience with, the, with what's happening in AI in the rest of the world. And in effect, this is what I mean. I mean, like, we, we should not ignore the fact that Europe has been bringing the wrong solutions on European level for, for Europe in, in, in quite a few years already. And unless we change it, I don't believe that the division that just give more power to the, to the Europe is going to bring us anywhere. My... My last, my last my last question to all of you um the new multipolarity that we are now entering and or that we are in and the 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 importance of china and still the 
the the the rise also of ASEAN and the the role of the BRIC states as they are as they are now working increasingly together. How do you see this this new in global environment then impacting the future of um, Europe's economy and monetary system? And maybe we go in reverse order. So um, Ardian first, and then Miroslav, and then Dejan. Yeah, the, it's a very complex world, I think, and the, the the money the money for a lot of reasons I think is the, is still in the center of uh, of the issue uh, is in the center. Everything which was not sold with money was trying to be sold with a lot of money, you know. And of course, uh, I I believe in a in a revolution of money, you know. The money will be revolutionized because many times we uh, people, you know, people try to accuse that the fault of all these problems, you know, in the transition uh, economies or economies, uh, emerging markets and going to developing economies. Many times they say, ah, the problem is the uh, the euro. The problem is the exchange rate. The problem is like that. It's not like that. The money does not have any uh, you know it's uh money is very peaceful you know money does not create the problem are the policies behind of that which create the problems and we have to look the big picture we have to see where the uh, where the problems are uh i think after the Bretton Woods, uh a lot of uh, uh, a lot of new problems came and uh, if you see in our relationship with uh with uh, fiat money and with gold and uh, and uh, the the bonds and shares and the, the the stock exchange there it's a very you know uh, the dynamic it's it's uh, it's very uh, i think bizarre sometimes and uh, it's also the problem of moral hazard and all these things we have a lot of uh, uh, general corruption on that. We have also a lot of shadow banking and uh, and geopolitics. Geopolitics, as I said, which is in the center. Everything is geopolitics. You know, politics in old Greek. It's we need to talk. We talk. Huh? But geopolitics now is that we are talking all of us. You know, and the problems are because we don't have any more. As I said. Uh, financial crisis, COVID, but we have war, and we have to see that we are working on war. And this geopolitics, of course, try to rebalance, rebalance the global, the global order. You know, we will have multipolarity for sure. But in this respect, money is not neglected. So there are initiatives of money. But as I said, we in Europe are far behind of this uh, revolutionary uh, approach with money. So we discussed 10 years ago, it was a heresy discussing of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, uh, alternative currencies, you know, and money, uh, not mentioned uh, the Bitcoins and the other ones. And uh, not to forget, we have not, not discussed about the CBDC and the others. Now they are discussing their project, but still, still, as I said, as I said, we have to change where are the problems. We have to change uh, the criteria of that. And we have to change uh, the mind of the people. What does it mean to revolutionize the, the, the money? And in this respect, I think we have to do a lot, a lot in digital currency and in CBDC. Because without that, we are far behind of the world. If you see America, and Europe on that is night and day. You cannot you cannot do something innovative in this respect in Europe in Europe because there is no legislation and where is legislation there is a lot of bottlenecks on that and cacophony on that between the states. So this is one thing. As per the BRICS, there is initiative. Uh, I don't think it's uh, there will be immediate ch immediate changes. If you see now the uh, the the weight of the dollar and the other and the other currencies, of course, dollar is six uh, above sixty percent, 
as a reserve currency, but uh, the others are coming, you know, from Renminbi and the other, but still Europe is in a good, uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a good position compared to It's 15 or 20 years uh, ahead of us, but this 20 and 30 years ahead of us is also the new program of Europe to change, to really change Europe, to really integrate Europe with all this. I do believe that there Ardian, sorry, your your camera is freezing up. Are you still there, Ardian? And also this, the tone. This is this is unfortunate, but maybe maybe we we um, Miroslav, can you can you take over and tell us your take okay. on the multipolarity? Okay, okay, just stop me if we if we get the Ardian back. Uh, I believe uh, first. I believe BRICS is uh, overrated, except China. If you if you if you have a look on sizes of BRICS economy, it's China and others, and small complements effectively. The only the only uh, country that can get sizable is uh, is uh, India. Yeah. And uh, at this moment, it's not sizable enough. Let me just to give you an idea uh, about its relative size. Poland economy. Is something like one fourth of of Indian economy currently, yeah? or new EU members are about half altogether, few millions of people compared with Indians, yeah? or few tens of millions of people compared with Indians, is something like half of size of uh, of Indian economy. Yes, India has a growth potential, and then it will become uh, really important. But so far, it's not. Yeah? And that uh, relates to to BRICS. I mean, like we we see a little bit of demise of Euro in uh, as a trading currency in a recent uh, recent period, we see a little bit of upswing of uh, Ramimbe, but uh, effectively the world is still trades in US dollars so in, uh, as as Arden. So I wouldn't overdo the uh, the bricks as a as a bulk. But what I would stress is that uh, they manage actually way lot better to orient themselves in a in a world of two two major powers. India is expert in uh, in doing that, I believe, and we should take a take a notion of that. I mean, like we, we 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 I really believe we should face a reality. We are not more a superpower as in the in the league of two big ones, and we should simply take a take a hit from that. And that would be my take on on BRICS. Let's look uh, on how the successful parts of of BRIC blocks are behaving in the world. Arena and how they are able to secure uh, the big two big ones as their actually supporting partners. Thank you for that. Guardian, uh, we, we lost you earlier. Do you just yeah. want to finish the thought just very quickly and then we yeah, are. Uh, yeah, uh, Miroslav understood me quite well and uh, what he said now. Despite not hearing you. <laughs> No, we are, we are uh, as, I, as I wanted to say, so, so, so you are, uh, dollar is the main, uh, the main uh, uh, currency uh, as a deposit currency with the central banks is more than 66%. And in it's going to 1%, but it's, uh, and then we have Europe with 20 and more percent. Still, Europe is uh, in a good position, but we are, we are US dollar. And these are challenges, as I said, maybe 20, 20 years challenges. We see, I fully agree with uh, with uh, with India, which is uh, expanding uh, even uh, even as uh, as a human capital uh, 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 from India. So we have now Indians in Albania working in the farming, you know, and not also in technology and the others. So India is a big part, which we have to consider that. Uh, but as uh, as a program, there is, as I said, the program for BRICS uh, for uh, for uh, for the currency. But it will take time, maybe twenty, maybe fifteen, twenty years, thirty years, who knows? But it's it fits with the program of Euro. It's also Euro program. Uh, the 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 tenor. It's uh, 
the next 20 years how we will uh, we'll see ourselves with this uh, with this growth packs uh, and 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 the others and uh, the, if we want to conclude i don't think is is that the, the conclusion the the, the dayan the dayan gets uh, still has his answer for the multipolarity question and then we conclude okay dayan. so but this, uh, i have to say that the uh, uh, Europe now is in, uh, in front of the very big and urgent challenges. And in my opinion, there are two, two roads to be followed. Either they change the hymn of Europe, change the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, or they change and auto-correct themselves. I, I, I thought you froze up again. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. The, the, the Beethoven is not, does not exist, maybe, <laughs> to change the Ninth Symphony from the hymn of the Europe. So maybe we'll have the other one to, to self-correct, to auto-correct ourselves. I mean, the Ninth Symphony is one of the few things that I don't have a problem with. So maybe we leave that one. But Dejan, uh, yeah. your take at multipolarity and the impact that's of right. the European that's continent. Right. So let's leave with Beethoven and Europe. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, uh, you know, I would hope to see that uh, this transition towards multipolarity and let's say the complete awareness that the the uh, world has shifted to a certain extent in 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 the um, economic development, which is uh, so to say significantly different um, to what it was a couple of decades back. I hope that its transition uh, goes peacefully uh, as, as possible. That's my my prior. Uh, uh, deep hope. Um, the other thing is that I believe that being a member of one club does not exclude uh, the possibility of being a member of all, also of another club. And I'm very glad that you have mentioned Asian countries, ASEAN countries. Uh, some of them are members of BRICS. You also, the, we didn't mention the other uh, organization, which is uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which also includes some of the BRIC members, but some do not. Uh, are, uh, some are not members, and so on. So there are, uh, I would say, these overlapping. Um, uh, so to say clubs or organizations some are much more developed with institutions being put in place some are not uh, but i would uh, like to see that um, uh, they de uh, develop and evolve in a non-confrontational manner uh, as an association of countries which have certain uh, type of common interests therefore i would like to see more a possibility uh, not just for the countries of asean which is sort of a european union in southeast asia right um, uh, also, some countries in European Union might be also very, more inclined to cooperate maybe with China and some other countries from the BRICS or, or the others. And I would like to see the detente because, in my view, the, the situation in which our planet and humanity is actually asks for cooperation and for, uh, let's say, supporting multilater multilateral institutions. Without uh, multilateralism, I'm not sure that we can solve global issues of today. They ask for the joint joint uh, approach, and uh, especially uh, between these two, let's say, poles, as we see them today, United States and China, what they would, for instance, uh, see as an appropriate uh, global policy for the future, I'm sure that we could get uh, other countries to follow much more easily and by confronting each other i'm not sure that we will be capable of solving the global issues that we are facing today thank you i i very much love these these final words we should uh, we should end the panel on this and the hope for cooperation rather than confrontation Mir um dejan shoshkic miroslav singer adian fulani thank you very much for your time today thank you very much for the talk glad to see you friends Thank you. Glad to Thank see you, you too.